Welcome to the Vital Living Forum. Today we'll be talking about the Florida Brain Bank Research Study. And our goal is to provide you with information and resources surrounding this service and to let you know how it benefits research studies and families. Joining me today are Edith Ginrin and Alexandria Garnier-Mercier with the Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center, Holly Jennings with Premier Senior Consultants, and Dr. Amanda Fletcher with ClinCloud Research. Welcome to you all. Thank you. I want to start out with you, Edith, and just to give us an idea of what the Brain Bank is, how it operates. Um, the Brain Bank is a post-mortem research study and it operates through community involvement. Essentially, it starts with a phone call to the agency, um, usually someone who's worried about their person saying, you know, where do we start? And so we say something along the lines of, do you have a diagnosis? Which is part of the criteria. If not, then we refer them on um, and to a memory disorder clinic or to one of our other community entities and a diagnosis is uh, worked on. That's something that Dr. Fletcher does and has done. So, uh, Alexandra, how does someone enroll into the brain bank? What is the criteria? They just have to call me. Okay. That's the first thing they need to just do. Call me. call me and then I will do an intake to find out, like you did said, if there is a diagnosis and if they have uh, the authorization to make that referral to, to us for uh, the brain donation, if they have durable power of attorney or healthcare surrogate. And I will uh, send them an application so they can fill out and give us the authorization to gather the medical records and also the consent to do the autopsy. It's very simple. As long as they have those things, they don't have to rush to the doctors. As long as they had a neurologist or geriatrician that saw them and will be able to proceed with the application. Very simple. And speaking of that, Dr. Fletcher, yeah. how do you isolate a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's um, I have a friend whose mother, who I love his mother, who um, he doesn't meet the criteria yet, but he knows something's not right with her thinking. She was a very sharp woman and then it started to decline. So what is the diagnosis process? Yeah, well really it just starts with the initial concern. So just like your friend, he's concerned already. So he can go to his primary care doctor and they can do an initial memory screen like a MOCA or a MMSE, which is just a memory screen. And they'll decide at that time, like, hey, does this patient need to go to a geriatrician or a neurologist? Myself as a neurologist, once I see that patient, I usually talk to the patient and the caregiver or loved one. And what I usually do is we would talk to the patient by themselves and do a little bit more memory testing in the clinic, but I'll also talk to the loved one or caregiver just to get a little bit more information because the truth is if they have some concern for some memory issues, we can't just rely on what the patient is saying. So once we gather all of that history, we'll decide at that time, hey, is it time to do a little bit more testing like blood work? Should we get an MRI or PET scan and some more imaging to support what we believe is going on? Another test that we like to do is something called neuropsychological testing, and I know that's a a big word, but really all that means is detailed memory testing. And it usually lasts between three to four hours. So along with the neurologist, we work with the neuropsychologist as well, and we gather all of that information. So the history, the blood test, the imaging, whether it be an MRI, CT scan, or PET scan, as well as a neuropsychological uh, evaluation. And we gather that information, and we try to understand and uh, go along with that to see, hey, what exactly are the contributors? Because we can't just say, hey, definitively that this is Alzheimer's disease. We also want to rule out other uh, potential causes for any memory issues as well. And even when we give the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, we never again say definitive, we say possible or probable. So that is also why we like the uh, brain bank as well, because that is the portion where it does give us a definitive diagnosis. And do you, what happens when you get, when you tell your loved one that um, you know, we're going to go see a doctor, we're going to go see Dr. Fletcher, um, and you get pushback. And they are just like, nothing's wrong with me, I'm fine, I just forget things sometimes. How do we handle that? It happens a lot, yeah. <laughs> more than we, um, we might realize. One of the things we suggest is to say something along the lines of, 
let's go. Let's go together. Um, let's go and both be tested because at ADRC, we believe that we all should have a baseline test. We should all have um, a measurement in our health record of where our cognition is. Sometimes we can say something like, Mom, we know there's something wrong. Let's go find out so we can get it fixed. Because we don't know what it is until we know what it is, right? And it could be something we could fix, yeah. right? Like neuropressure hydro normal pressure hydrocephalus or something Even like that. Even thyroid problems can contribute. Yeah. Yeah. But or I, UTI. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. well, those, again, the point of getting the blood test and having that initial evaluation. But I actually see that a lot within the practice where patients and their loved ones are just like, oh my goodness, the loved one is saying, they will not come to the clinic. So like Edith said, we really have to say, well, hey, how about we evaluate both of you guys? And the good thing even with ClinCloud Research is we offer memory screens anyways, and we actually recommend as a neurologist for everyone over the age of 50 to get a memory screen. So it's as simple as even before going to the doctor, maybe just completing a memory screen. You know, it seems like the brain bank is a really important component in making a diagnosis. Tell us a little bit about the history of the brain bank, when it started and, and, and what its, its mission is. Well, the mission, the ultimate mission is to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease. Um, it does address other um, illnesses oh. now. It was actually started in this tiny little agency, ADRC, by our founder, Pat Jimison. Um, her husband and father both were diagnosed with um, presumptive Alzheimer's disease and working in conjunction with Dr. Gary Pearl. Um, she asked him to do an autopsy on the brains of both of her, her people, and really that's how it got started. She took it to the state and said, look, this is important stuff. And the state agreed and said, well, let's fund this, and that's essentially how it got started. How are the donated brains used? Well, um, they are used for research. Mm -hmm. They do a de-autopsy and uh, at Mayo Clinic, and they will do a neuropathology report and send that report to us. And we can send that to the family, the family can share it, or we can send to the doctor who had seen the patient while they were alive with the consent of the family so they can see exactly, yes, it was indeed Alzheimer's disease or it was not Alzheimer's disease if it was Lewy body dementia or any other type of illnesses. And usually, so far, Edith, uh, as far as I've been with the ADRC and Edith as well, we don't see only one illness of the brain. They can find seven, nine other additional illnesses. In 19. The brain. Yes, one time. Yeah, so. Different forms of dementia, yes. to be clear. Or the, you have the mixed pathology. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very, very often, though, when it is Alzheimer's disease, it's also Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body and dementia. Mm -hmm. They often occur together. Yeah. And can anybody donate their brain to the brain bank, or is there a curation process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can do that because the people who are. Uh, who have a normal brain. I don't know if we have normal brains. Well, <laughs> uh, we're a little bit crazy, but uh, the, the people who don't have any uh, memory issues, they can do that. They can donate their brain, and it's called a control case. So they can compare a brain who has not been affected with any form of dementia with another brain. So they can still do those studies to find either a cure or to slow down the process of, uh, of having any memory issues of the development of that illness. Yeah. And is there a fee associated with donation? Oh, no, at all. Oh. Everything is free of charge. And uh, they have to have a funeral home in place or a full, full service funeral home or a cremation uh, company. And sometimes we do have grants for the transport, you know, mm -hmm. of the body to the hospital, to the local hospital where we do the procurement, or the funeral home will provide uh, the access to their care center in the west coast of Florida, so the pathologist on call or the forensic technician can do the procurement at the care center of the funeral home. And how does somebody enroll in the brain bank? They call Alexandra. They call me. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. They call Alexandra. Call Alex. And you're good. 
Well, we are going to come back with more uh, information about the Florida Brain Bank research study. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Vital Living Forum. We are talking about the Florida Brain Bank Research Study, and we are joined again by Alexandria Garnier-Mercier with the Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center and Dr. Amanda Fletcher with ClinCloud Research. And we're also joined by Holly Jennings with Premier Senior Consultants. Thank you for being with us, and Holly, welcome. Thank you. Holly, I'll start with you. If you're caring for someone who is dealing with Alzheimer's, that means you have to find a facility to care for that person. What does that entail? Yes, thank you. So a lot of times, especially after you've received some type of diagnosis for your loved one, it, you can definitely feel a little overwhelmed and not knowing what the next step is. So what I always recommend and what we do at Premier Senior Consultants is kind of help the family and guide them through that process. So we begin that by just doing some, an intake and just finding out what the needs are for their loved one and then helping the family kind of decide some next steps. So a lot of that would entail looking into and considering maybe a memory care community for them. Well, Alexandria, I wonder what happens when someone who is enrolled in the brain bank study passes away. What's the process for how that person then becomes, uh, their, their brain is brought to the brain bank? So the first thing they need to do is to call us. We have a dedicated phone line so they can call. The first person to call is us, the brain bank, and then we are in charge of calling the funeral home and to talk with, as well, hospice. They have hospice in place, which is very important. And the hospice will give us uh, the information pertaining to the death. We will gather some report. We will coordinate with the PCC at the hospital, which is um, uh, the person, the nurse on call there that will receive uh, uh, the funeral home driver. Um, and we will coordinate with them. We will also call the pathologist on call to let them know the body will arrive at XYZ time. We have the ETA. So we can coordinate everything and ease the family burden. So that's what we do immediately when the person dies. And after that, we'll, when the procurement is done, the body will be returned to the facility, the, the, uh, the funeral home. So yeah. that they can have a they funeral They can have the, the arrangement, or... the cremation, or an open casket, whatever arrangement they had done, you know, they arranged, Excellent. or they are prearranged. And Dr. Fletcher, um, Alexandria mentioned um, a report. That, that's the neuropathology report. Yes. And that's... what is that and how is it used? Yeah, so that's the neuropathology report that she's uh, discussing. And usually it will take about a day to multiple uh, weeks to generate that report back. But that neuropathology report basically serves as the final diagnostic report as far as the final diagnosis of what was contributing to uh, that loved one's uh, memory issues and uh, dementia. And we talked about a little bit about Lewy body uh, dementia and, and Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Are there any other diseases that can be diagnosed um, through the brain bank? Yes, so the neuropathology report, although we're discussing the brain, is actually looking at the different parts of our central and peripheral nervous system, so including the brain, the spinal cord, and the peripheral nerves. But you can also find within the uh, neuropathology report, you can find disorders of tumors for the brain, infections, inflammatory process, and of course, we're more concerned about the neurodegenerative processes, of course, the Alzheimer's, of course, uh, the Lewy body, but you can uh, also be diagnosed of frontal temporal degeneration, uh, vascular disease. And the truth also is studies have shown majority of time when patients are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, about 50% of them is usually a mixed etiology and mixed dementia. Mm -hmm. So this again is so important for the brain uh, donation so we can understand this uh, further. Is that a report you're holding? There? It is a report I'm holding. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm yeah. glad you noticed. Because well, I wondered um, how that report could be of value to surviving family members. Yeah. 
I think is really a lot of value for surviving family members. And just to go over just an example of it, um, thank you for to a colleague for providing this example. Example. And basically, the neuropathology report is broken up into two parts: uh, the gross uh, description, and the gross description is basically what you see with the naked eye. We're looking at the human brain with the naked eye, so we're looking to see if there's any discoloration, uh, any size abnormalities, whether there's shrinkage, whether there's pieces missing. Uh, and then we're able to look at the microscopic uh, description, and that's whatever we can see under a microscope. So this is where we're able to stain the different parts of the brain, and we can see if there's any abnormal protein buildup that are associated with Alzheimer's disease or Lewy body, see if there's any vascular changes that's associated with uh, vascular disease. But the main part that the family members are, of course, uh, concerned about is that final diagnosis. So uh, by the end of looking at the gross description, the microscopic uh, description, you're actually able to see the final diagnosis. And for this example, like we were just discussing, majority of the patients that are diagnosed with Alzheimer's is actually a mixed uh, picture of it. And this even showed that this is uh, a mixed picture of Lewy body, as well as Alzheimer's, as well as vascular disease. And usually what the pathologist will also put not only the final diagnosis, they'll also put comments. And the comments are important because it also gives the family members a little bit more peace about what the uh, loved one was diagnosed with when they were alive, but also in preparation just in case for the future and any genetic uh, predisposition that future family members may have. And you know, Holly, what Dr. Fletcher was talking about, you can infer that Alzheimer's and all of the other associated uh, diseases could show up in many different ways. How do you find a facility that can handle your loved one's particular needs? Yeah, that's a great question. So what we typically like to do, and we partner a lot together in that, um, once we find out what that diagnosis is, and also sometimes they also have additional diagnoses we need to keep in mind. Maybe it's insulin dependency, or they need some other types of care. So what we're able to do um, for them is to help take a look at everything, the whole picture, and then help find the right community. Because a lot of people don't realize, especially with memory care and the 20 years I've now been in the industry, it's come a long way in, in the fact that they can allow them to age in place and through this journey. So we may look at a larger community, let's say if somebody is more ambulatory and they need more um, interaction and social activities, but then sometimes we have someone that is, you know, really slowed down in their journey and their progress. So a small um, assisted living home style with only five to six residents is more appropriate. It helps keep behaviors down and anxiousness and things. So that's where we're able to help is to be able to kind of get the whole picture because everybody takes it down in their journey differently. So we want to find the right environment for that. And are we starting to see more diagnosis of Alzheimer's or are we getting better at diagnosing it? What is the, the landscape? It, it's something that, to my knowledge, I had not heard of 25 years ago. And I wonder, are we just, we're just get, getting better at understanding it? Is that what's happening or is it the incidence is, is more prevalent? I think that we're getting better with diagnosing it, and that is why the neuropathology report in the brain bank is so important, because we're able to see whether what the final diagnosis was supports what it was when we diagnosed when the patient was alive. So I think it's just all about the advancement in medicine and scientific research, and this mm -hmm. is improving our diagnosis for patients. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about resources, so stay with us on this edition of Vital Living Forum. We'll be right back. Welcome back to this edition of Vital Living Forum. And we are joined again by Edith Gendron. Edith, welcome back. Thank you. Holly, I wanted to ask you a question about resources. Are there resources for information that a family or loved one could find out what I do, where I begin this journey to help my loved one. Absolutely. And a lot of times that's where the conversation will start. And when I usually get a family that reaches out to me, you know, realizing that they need to take some next steps, we definitely talk through that. What I usually recommend is looking at all the resources like you mentioned. That could look like 
private duty where someone comes in the home and maybe they want to stay home initially and just get a little bit of that support, especially if there's a spouse involved. Sometimes it gets difficult for them to also manage. Um, then we can then look at also things like uh, adult services, day services, maybe where they're able to go and be engaged during part of the day. Another option is respite. Respite is what we see is more for like a short-term stay. This is a great opportunity to see how someone is going to do in that assisted living or memory care environment. So that's an option. And then the final one that we always look at is when it's time to actually make a, a transition and make a move. What I usually suggest with that, even though that may not be what you prefer, it helps so much for us to look ahead instead of waiting for the crisis. Because most people I help is in the crisis, where they've waited too long, now their loved one maybe is in short-term rehab, can't return home, and then the adult children are looking for a place their parent has no choice in. So I like to always encourage that we can look at all the options so you know your resources and then be able to plan accordingly. And Alexandra, are there state or federal agencies that we could look to for support as oh, well? Yes, definitely. In the state of Florida, anywhere in Florida, they have area agency on aging. They have 11 area agency on aging in the entire state. Here in Central Florida, we are PSA 7, and they can call the elder helpline, the area agency on aging, and they can apply for assistance. Like she was talking about mm -hmm. respite care, if they need that, and sometimes they cannot afford to mm -hmm. pay for it, they, uh, they will have a priority list, they will have an intake, and they'll be able to you know, fund the, the respite care. And they have also other programs such as community care for the elderly or the long-term care program through Medicaid. So if they don't know, the first thing they need to do, they can call us. We have what they call the care coaching, and they will we will analyze everything that, you know, what's going on to find the right resource for them. And sometimes they may need ramps, grab bars, and we will tell them where to go to get those things free of charge. Yeah. And Edith, what other services do, does ADRC provide as well? Yeah, we, um, it's important to note that any service we provide uh, from the brain bank right on through is at no charge to people. Alexandra mentioned care coaching. That is a private one-on-one -on -one meant for the, the care partner, the caregiver, or the concerned person. It is not meant for the person for whom we have concerns. The goal there is to discuss um, the circumstances and come up with a plan. And what is that plan? It may very well be um, discussing with Alexandra how they apply for assistance. Sometimes we get folks who say, we have no health insurance, where do we start? And that's where our community partners um, like ClinCloud are so incredibly valuable to us because we can say, okay, um, ClinCloud can help you. They can help you with a memory screen and depending on what is um, available at that very given time, more tests to determine what's going on in this person's brain. We have support services um, in the form of support groups. We have some very specific ones for adult daughters, adult granddaughters, for men. Um, we have a Spanish-speaking support group. Our Alexandra is our multilinguist, um, so that's important to note, too. And we also have, we say in information and referral, that's a little lofty. It boils down to we answer the phone. <laughs> <laughs> we answer the phone and we answer your questions. Um, we will help anyone who calls anywhere in the state or even in the country, quite frankly. We also offer uh, workshops. They can be from one to two hours. We offer training series, um, six-week training series that are meant to increase the confidence of that care partner, that caregiver. I use those words interchangeably. And it um, allows them to learn skills, strategies, tools for working with the person, keeping the person's dignity maintained and the highest level of independence possible. Someone is probably going to really need this information, so I want to thank you all for being here. But I want to, I'm interested, I will yeah. start with you and go down the line, sure. Holly. What got you interested in this kind of work, this line of work? Oh, thanks. So about 20 years ago, I found myself um, 
as funny as it is, a business office director in an assisted living community after finishing college. And um, I then had the opportunity to move into an executive director role. So for about nine years, I was able to you know, serve seniors at the administrator capacity and really enjoyed that. However, I, there was always something in me that just wanted to actually give true client support in the sense of finding the right option, even if it wasn't mine that I was currently working in. So I started Premier Senior Consultants with another colleague. We did that um, 11 years ago. And since then, I've had the pleasure of helping families find the right senior living options. Um, there's no cost for my service either. The communities take care of that. So it just gives me the opportunity to just really feel like I can help them through the whole process and just finding the right fit. Alexandra? Well, it was my grandmother. Mm. My grandmother had some form of dementia. We don't know which type. And she used to come to my room when I was uh, younger and ask, what time is it? It's 10,000 times within <laughs> three, three minutes. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know what was going on. But I, you know, in, along the way, I went and I studied business. But something dragged me back to do gerontology. So I did my master in gerontology. And I worked for a telephone company. And I realized uh, the people calling they had memory issues. They didn't know what they were paying, what was going on. And I said, well, this is not for me to work for that big uh, you know, uh, telephone company. And I went to work with the Area Agency on Aging, helping people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think also it's my upbringing. We, uh, I went to school and uh, to Catholic school. They always ask us to help people in need and volunteer. So that's what I did, and I'm still working <laughs> in helping people, and that's my passion, and uh, that's in memory of my grandmother. Excellent. Yeah. Edith, how about you? Isn't it, uh, I'm, <laughs> brings tears to my eyes. Um, and I'm trying to quickly think how I answer this. My mother um, and I lived with, with an aunt in Maine who owned a small nursing home. So my first friends is a really little person were elderly people. Um, her name was Rhody. She was 90 years old. And it started there. I have always, always wanted to be um, someone who helped people who uh, were older, who didn't have the help they needed. Um, and to that end, I've done everything from being back in the day when we said nurse's aide instead of certified nursing assistant. Mm -hmm. uh, nurse's aide, I too was um, uh, an administrator of an assisted living facility. I've been a Medicaid waiver specialist. We work for the area agency on aging together. So where I am today, it's like a culmination of everything I've ever wanted to do because we truly help. And for us, the three of us here in particular, the critical thing is we can always do the right thing. Yeah. Always. Mm -hmm. And that's what drives this bus. Well, I want to thank you. This information, as I said before, really is going to help families, mm -hmm. help individuals who are taking care of uh, someone who's dealing with the potential of having Alzheimer's or any other brain disease. So I really appreciate you being with us. The Brain Bank program is critical for scientific research that's aimed at curing Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, furthering an ongoing scientific understanding of these illnesses. It also contributes to the overall improvement of diagnosis and treatment and is integral to the mission of the Florida Brain Bank program. We hope that you've learned as much as we have today and walk away with a better understanding of how and why becoming a donor is important. Thanks for being with us.